Hi everyone, and welcome to this mini lecture on the American Dream and class mobility. This mini lecture is addressing one of the, the themes we're looking at in this course, Popular Culture in the U.S., being taught at North Shore Community College. And within this, we're trying to get a sense, or just get a better, broader sense of that idea of the American Dream, because it's a theme, it's an idea that permeates a lot of American popular culture, a lot of culture in general, um, but particularly within American culture we see uh, this idea come up time and again. And I'll look at a few examples, but r the reality is there's very, there's very few, na particularly narratives uh, within popular culture where this idea isn't present to some degree or other. So let's start off talking about the American Dream. Now the concept of the American Dream has been around um, forever. I shouldn't say forever. It should, you know, it's been around for as long as the concept of the United States as a singular entity has been around. But the actual terminology of the American Dream actually comes to us in the 1930s from James Truslow, uh, James Truslow Adams's Epic of America. And, J and Adams was a historian, and this is where he starts to kind of piece together this concept of the dream that we, we know of or that we think of. People hear this term American Dream, and there's a certain amount of associations that they have with it. So one aspect of the American dream is of course becoming American. Uh, this is the dream of course of the immigrant and American culture is, is deeply connected to the immigrant because of course we're a culture of immigrants. And so one aspect of the American dream is to actually be considered American. Um, that is moving to this country and fully encapsulating or, or being seen as part of the culture. We also see within the American dream this idea of mobility, of movement, and we'll talk about movement and productivity a lot with the American dream because those are driving forces behind it. When we talk about mobility, we're of course in one element talking about economic mobility. Uh, typically we see that as in two ways. One is individual economic mobility and typically when we say mobility with the American dream we mean upward mobility. That is the individual works from either impoverished conditions or working conditions and achieves middle class or upper class status. But there's also very strongly within narratives around the American dream the intergenerational economic mobility upward. That is the parents worked hard in very you know very challenging working class conditions so that the child would be able to go to college, would be able to aspire to middle class uh, or upper class. So we see economic mobility as a part of the American dream, and that can happen on the individual level, uh, but also on the intergenerational level. And both of those are important because we'll see, again, family is another major piece of the American dream. But we also see uh, mobility on the social end. It's not just class, but where people are accepted. You know, it's not just it's not just your money that will get you into the country club. It's your social status. It's you know, it's how you're perceived by your culture. And this comes into play, particularly with with minority groups, um, with people who are not part of the dominant group, and kind of how they can see social mobility in their lives, uh, being able to go places they couldn't before. So this is another piece of that American dream and educational mobility. You know, this idea of going from little to no education to highly educated or the doors that education will open up for people. This is in fact why people of course con continually go to college is an attempt to attain mobility. And while that mobility students often think is just economic mobility, oh, I will get you know, I'll I'll learn these skills and I'll get these jobs. There's an element of social mobility and educational mobility that also come with that. There's a there's a status to be to be to say, I have a degree or I have you know a I have a bachelor's degree or I have a master's degree or I have a doctorate. There's a certain amount of status and that status is again an element of mobility. You've worked your way up. Because within all of this, this idea of mobility is centered on or, or strongly connected to meritocracy. That the American dream is very much this idea that, you know, through your own skill, you can earn your way or work your way up that socioeconomic ladder, 
right? So you make your way up that ladder by your skill, by your intelligence, by your hard work. And so something like a doctorate's degree is a signal of your hard work. Something like a lot of wealth that you've earned over your life is a signal of your hard work. These aren't entirely true. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit in a critique of the American dream, but it's, it's worth being aware that these are what's embedded when we talk about the American dream. Within all of this, so within all of this is this idea that the person aspiring to the American dream is self-reliant. They are able to take care of themselves and more importantly, or I should say as importantly, they are a provider. They are able to build and develop a family, or that is to produce a family and to provide for them uh, in some typically financially, not often emotionally kind of way. So these are some of the ideals that we see within the American dream. Um, that self-reliance, the, mer you know, the meritocracy that allows for the mobility, the becoming American, uh, these are the major things that drive narratives about the American dream. But there are concerns and critiques of the American dream. There are ways in which people uh, find that idea and its prevalence across so many platforms of storytelling and narratives within our culture a bit disconcerting, a bit challenging. So for instance, the first thing is that it's a romantic notion. And we talked about this when we talked, you know, in the mini lecture about cowboys in the Western is that, you know, it is this idealized view that, you know, the expectation is that everybody aspires to the American dream and that it is easily, you know, it is achievable so long as you do X, Y, and Z. Uh, but the fact of the matter is it isn't. And it puts certain types of identities and relationships on a pedestal often to the detraction, to the criticism, to the devaluing of other relationships, other types of identities. It's also very gender-based, um, less so nowadays, but there, you know, for the longest time, you know, the American dream is that the husband or the male is going to be the character, going to be the person who goes out and does the work so that he can provide for his wife and children. And so the you know your role within the American dream is proportionally in relation is in is in direct relation to you know where you fall within gender and sex in our culture and that's a, that's certainly problematic and that's certainly something that's been hard to undermine and to get out of is this idea of the woman as the homemaker and that's her aspiration of the American dream she may go out and get a college education but she should be back and home taking care of the children um, it's a critique that comes up time and again because it, you know we still see how it lingers today it's also sexually based and what I mean by that is this is a very heterosexually privileged uh, concept. It's what we would call heteronormative when we get to talking about gender, sex, and sexuality. Uh, when we get on to that module, it, the idea is that in order to participate, in order to aspire to the American dream, you have to be in a heterosexual relationship uh, in order to achieve that. And of course, you know, we see this, we see this becoming less so as equal marriage has increasingly became legal across um, many states. And eventually, you know, elements of this will be um, certainly erased as equal marriage becomes legal across the country. But there's still this implicit, you know, dynamic of you have a, a family figure and a you know a lead or a dominant family figure who is the breadwinner um, the American dream may be captured by the the both parents or both partners working but it's not necessarily valued as much very much of the American dream is focused on production and what I mean by this is it, it finds its roots in the Puritan ethic of always working and not wasting one's time. And so the American dream is about being productive, being productive at work, as well as being productive at home. And what we mean by that is reproducing, right? There is this implicit for, for you to attain or for, the, for it to be considered American dream. There has to be children. There has to be your 2.5 kids. Uh, there does have to be some means of reproducing or production involved. And that certainly is something that people critique a lot because if 
if you are expected to have children, is that really a choice? Um, yes, there's the evolutionary element to this, but there's there's an increasing large criticism about the demand or the expectation of reproduction. If you think about couples, you know, as soon as they are married, the first question they ask, they're asked by everybody is, are you having children? And implicit in that is, are you doing what you're supposed to? Um, so there is this critique about the American dream really pushing reproduction without necessarily thinking. And there's also an element within the American dream that decreases empathy. And what it is is the you know stories of the American dream promote this idea of the meritocracy. That if you work hard enough, you can achieve your dreams, you can achieve wealth, you can achieve progress, you can achieve all of these things. So that promotes this idea of a just world. You work hard, you, you get your rewards. And therefore, people that don't achieve success are blamed. They did not work hard enough. They are lazy. They are stupid. So the American dream is nice in that it can push people, but those people that succeed, there's a higher tendency to, for them to look at those that didn't and say, it's your own fault. You failed. You're a failure. And that's a really big critique of the American dream because it, it, de it destroys empathy. It destroys our ability to understand, you know, the way the paths or the numerous paths that each of us are exposed to. They're not all the same path in that if one person is successful, that doesn't mean everybody else can be successful. The economic system of capitalism clearly indicates that not everybody is going to be successful and that it, it wouldn't be sustainable if everybody was. So, you know, this is, a, this is a significant concern about or critique of the American dream. All right, so let's, let's take a look at a couple examples of the American dream uh, from popular culture. The, the cornerstone of many of our stories around the American dream comes from Horatio Alger in his stories, um, particularly or most popularly, Ragged Dick. And his stories are the quintessential rags to riches, where you find a boy, or typically a boy, there's sometimes girls, but usually it's a boy who is in some kind of tough financial situation and through gumption, hard work, and a little bit of luck, makes his way from you know his poorer conditions into richer conditions. And he writes lots and lots of these dime novels that become popular um, throughout the 1800s and 1900s and still are sometimes read today. Norman Rockwell uh, is, a, is, a, is an artist who people may or may not be familiar with. He's, he painted a lot of pictures um, or he did a lot of covers for the Saturday Evening Post and many would consider his pictures very idyllic or, or capturing this idea of Americana and in particularly the American dream. Idyllic childhood, this idea of the family, this idea of, of you know, um, people building up and believing and uh, believing in the, their ability to become better. There's a lot to be said about um, Norman Rockwell's influence on the idea of the American dream because he captured it in a variety of ways so well in many of his paintings. The game of life um, and certainly I would say a modern rendering you know Sims these are two games that value the American dream and that you're supposed to work your way through in order to you know aspire to your house and your kids and your car and um, you know your white picket fence and all of that and that this is a game that of course trumpets and really values the American dream. People participating in it, that's the goal. In The Sims, the goal is of course to be productive, is to maintain your home, is to develop a family and things like that. The Brady Bunch, for those that are familiar, was a, you know, was a, was a definitely a TV show that captured the American dream. I mean, it gave it a little bit of a variation by saying here are two separate families that come together but it was still that idea of you know the husband being a hard worker trying to raise the kids right and at the same time you know the wife being the provider and caretaker um, although also occasionally working but there was a very interesting dynamic here of these of 
you know, promoting that American dream, that these kids are going to try hard and they're going to be good students and they're going to go off and be good workers. And in fact, the older ones, this is what they had to do occasionally. They would get their jobs and they would have to, you know, learn about hard work and, and hopefully that would teach them to become uh, better people to make their own American dream. Full House was another, was another, it was another, um, set of narratives that, you know, encouraged or promoted the American dream of, you know, and again, we have this broken family that kind of comes together and tries to raise these children to, you know, aspire to become productive citizens, to become, you know, to go to college, to do these things. But we also have critiques of the American dream. We have critiques of how the, the problems it presents or the challenges or its limitations. You know, one of the one of the earliest critiques is, of course, uh, *The Great Gatsby* by F. Scott Fitzgerald, in which you know this aspiration for economic and social mobility backfires in a lot of different ways. It pr it becomes tragic in the ways in which you know aspiring towards that American dream backfires. *Death of a Salesman* is another one in which you know you have the characters, uh, you know the, this view that the American dream is, is attainable um, just through hard work and we see through the story of course the the family falls apart uh, we see that the dream isn't attained that they are largely you know practically in poverty by the end of the story one of my favorites uh, one of my favorite critiques of of the American dream is happiness and this is a film from 1998 um, it's a very intense film in a lot of ways but it really does disrupt this idea of what it means to aspire to um, happiness or, or particularly the American dream which is America or US culture's icon of happiness Breaking Bad is another great example of the American dream gone wrong or the critique of the American dream. In this series, Walter White attempts to do everything and work hard. I mean, he's busting his butt not only at a full-time position, but then also working in a car wash in order to make ends meet, in order to provide for his wife and chil his, his one child and other child on the way. And of course, it all goes horribly wrong. He comes down with cancer, which, you know, creates a whole other slew of problems, and it sends him down this path of destruction, death, and drug dealing. So it's, it's a fascinating critique of the American dream and the limitations and the problems that it presents to a modern population. So just very quickly, you know, one way of trying to figure out if a, if a narrative or if something is really encouraging or discouraging or encouraging or critiquing the idea of the American dream is does the narrative by its end reaffirm American identity, family, or meritocracy? If it does, then it's probably a narrative that really promotes or captures the American dream. Or does, by the narrative's end, challenge or raise questions and concerns about American identity, family, or meritocracy? When you find that, then you're looking at something that's critiquing the American dream. And what you often find is that number one comes out in a lot of popular narratives. Uh, you see this in, in the majority of films, you see this in the majority of novels, the majority of sitcoms and TV shows. But number two, you don't see as much, but it's usually what garners people's attention. It's usually what garners a bit more awards. Um, not entirely surprising because there's an element of this represents more elite culture than the, those that just straight, straightforwardly promote the American dream. Um, but you, de you do not see number two as much, but it's definitely out there. And it's surprising when it shows up. Um, for some people because they don't always realize that that's what it's critiquing. All right, that's all for now. Thank you very much for watching, and see you in the next lecture.